Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the lecture tonight. Um, and uh, I'm Hilary Sample. I'm an associate professor here in the architecture uh, program. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Elena Jamil um, here. Uh, she's formed her uh, eponymous firm, Elena Jamil Architects, uh, in 2005 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, it, she's uh, where it's a great privilege to have her here this evening. It's her first time lecturing at Columbia and also in the US, so I think it's a very special um, moment for her to be here and for us to have her here. Um, she's, let's say, started her office <clears throat> by focusing on small-scale projects, um, works that she's carefully um, curated in a way, a, a kind of practice that can focus on uh, ideas around uh, new, new design work that really takes um, on the idea of pleasure and delight um, while also synthesizing constraints uh, from local um, context, be those um, cultural, climatic, or uh, focused on building culture. Um, I think it's interesting to note that really her beginning um, into a career in architecture revolved around uh, understanding building and, and perhaps construction, um, but she has really turned that into something much more delightful. Um, her, her firm has really demonstrated uh, these ideas around possibilities of local and sustainable materials, specifically uh, bamboo, um, through ideas around the contemporary um, and as a way to innovate. Um, and so what for us, maybe here in New York, thinking more um, carefully about things like steel and concrete or something like CLT construction, I think for her, has become um, through the use of bamboo. The Bamboo Playhouse, a pavilion of uh, connected permanent structures designed for the city of Kuala Lumpur's oldest park, Perdanda Botanical Garden, uses traditional ver vernacular structural technique of the Wakaif to show how sustainable materials can be brought back into use in contemporary and beautiful ways. The firm's many pavilions in different materials afford them the opportunity to explore recurring themes in the process of making techniques, local natural materiality, and recognizable forms much more difficult to deploy in larger buildings. Um, however, I think these ideas are not um, in her mind and built work just at a small scale, but are transforming into larger projects, um, even if they are, let's say, uh, more oriented towards design research or self-initiated, but nonetheless are becoming manifest in her projects um, by expanding into larger structures like the Bamboo Terrace Homes, comprised of 48 units constructed entirely out of bamboo and bamboo composite to create an economical mass-produced system that limits carbon footprints and is repeatable. The structures are light, require less machinery, and the material is faster to renew than traditional materials. She is working with specialists on growth and treatments to increase the effectiveness and longevity of the structures. Um, she was trained at the Welsh School of Architecture at Cardiff University in the United Kingdom. She joined the architecture faculty at the Welsh School while completing her Master's of Philosophy uh, for a project called An Ordinary Place, Open Frameworks for Urban Housing. She also holds a PhD from the same university called Rethinking Modernism, the Sudgen House and the Mother's House. In 2008, she won the RIBA Flood Proof Houses for the Future Competition, uh, sorry, for the Future Competition and the My Shelter Foundation Millennium School Competition, an opportunity to build her first bamboo prototype structure um, that could resist uh, winds up to 93 miles per hour from a typhoon in the Philippines. Her research and writing on construction techniques have been published in Architecture Malaysia magazine, including the cover of the October issue this month for the recently completed Buzz uh, AR, Bazaar Community Center, which she brought a wonderful copy for us to see. Um, her office has also been shortlisted for the 2017 Firm of the Year Award for Sustainable Architecture by the American Architecture Prize, and shortlisted for Emerging Designer of the Year by DZine in 2018. And she's also been the recipient of many World Architecture Foundation Awards. So it's my pleasure to welcome you. Thank you, Hilary, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm, uh, it's with great, great pleasure 
uh, for me uh, to be here today. So I will discuss some of my projects um, in connection or, or, or around the idea of uh, making connections for a contextual architecture, uh, which describes an approach in our work where there is a strong connection between new interventions and local conditions and also the past. It's based on the belief that there is much to learn from the existing and from the past. And this accumulated experience um, found in, in place uh, helps us to make a better decision about the future. So this is my second trip to New York. I was here about 16 years ago on the way to visit uh, Vanna Venturi's house. <coughs> Before I arrived, I, arrived I, I thought I might find myself in a, a generic uh, city, but um, I'm uh, very surprised to find myself in a city that is so unique that it could only be New York. Um, the way the buildings come close up to the street, um, the brick and stone uh, materials, um, and also, more importantly, the life on the streets, and uh, the kind of spontaneous activity and the conviviality that you see here. And developing cities and developing countries like where I come from try to emulate uh, cities like New York, like Chicago, but sometimes we forget that it's things that happens on the ground that are really important and what's available and uh, local conditions are quite important as well. So I come from um, somewhere very different geographically from here. Um, we are very close to the equator. Um, Kuala Lumpur, the city where I practice, is about 200 uh, miles north of the equator. So the climate is hot and very humid, and our daytime temperatures um, rarely go below 28 degrees Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, this means that you could live your whole life in Malaysia without owning a jumper or a sweater. But ironically, you would need one uh, to go inside buildings because most of our internal spaces are heavily, heavily air conditioned. Um, so our geographic location and our climate gives us this staggeringly beautiful rainforest, um, which has always been the kind of uh, the resource for everyday life um, is a source of food, is source of shelter, source of building materials, and even medicine. And like most rainforests all over the world, um, it's under threat from rampant deforestation as we become more urbanized, as our population continue to grow and become more industrialized. So I would our geography, our climatic conditions, means that the pavilion typology is the ideal building form. And this is an early, well, in fact, it's the earliest photo of a pavilion structure taken by W.A. Graham, which is a British advisor to the Sultan in 1908. And it's an open structure without walls, there are columns that supports a roof that's very sheltering. It's deeply pitched to kind of expel rainwater as quickly as possible. We get heavy rainfall during monsoon season. And it's uh, as, as a platform that's raised off the ground to keep it clean. So the pavilion structure evolved into something a little bit more sophisticated. And this is the village um, house. It's called the Malay Kampung House. And it's again shaped by the direct response to climate and to natural resources and traditional lifestyle. Uh, it sits lightly on earth. It's raised off the ground on stilts. The space below the house is usually used for working. You would build a boat or mend a boat or you would sew or you would weave, uh, weave uh, materials um, under this house. And on the main upper level is the living quarters. Um, there's always a veranda which is shaded by the roof and internally the spaces are very open, it's open planned and there are openings on all sides so there's lots of cross ventilation and the roof again uh, responds to the climate, it's steeply pitched, uh, it has 
uh, a large overhang, so it shades the, the house very, very well. So those of you who's not um, familiar with Malaysia will be amazed um, by how modern and quite progressive we are. Um, we have some of the tallest building in the world. We have uh, the tallest twin towers by Caesar Pelli. And 70% of our population actually lived in, uh, live in urban areas, so making us uh, one of the most urbanized country in uh, Southeast Asia. And more and more of these towers are coming up every day and lots more um, highways are snaking through these um, tall buildings. But at ground level, um, there are still remnants of structures that reminds us of a way of building uh, driven by local climate and local conditions. And uh, this is a, a typical village house uh, located right in the heart of Kuala Lumpur. There is actually a village enclave within the Kuala Lumpur area, city centre, uh, which is now, uh, might not be around for very long. There are plans to have them removed and uh, replaced with uh, high density buildings which fits the worth of the land. So if you would like to visit, you need to be quite quick to see these wonderful structures in the city. Um, an important lesson from the timber house is that shading is very, very important in our climate. And the vernacular houses has inspired these uh, colonial buildings, uh, which is built later than the village houses. And here you see um, a kind of a skin uh, or a veranda along the front facade that shades the, the spaces behind it. And shading cuts a lot of solar gain in a hot and humid climate. It reduces the, the kind of the temperature inside the, the, the rooms. Another interesting thing that we find important in our work is the openness uh, seen in vernacular architecture, um, openness that allows for different activities to take place. There is almost no truly functional space in a traditional uh, house in Malaysia. Um, here is a diagram um, showing uh, the interior space of a, of a, of a traditional house. And uh, there is minimal furniture. You would eat, sleep, and cook directly on the floor. It is the changes in level that suggest different use, the kind of uh, the, the, the size of space that suggests different use, but it doesn't really prescribe use. It's quite an open, um, indeterminate space. It's the, it's the levels that kind of suggest the kind of use that you could do, but, but it's open to different things that could happen. So this openness and indeterminacy uh, reminds us of the Fun Palace by Cedric Price. Um, it's, it's like a formwork that could allow for um, different activities to take place. It's a kind of democratic architecture which we find fascinating and we find that we use this, this uh, approach in, in some of our work. Um, we're living our every, everyday lives in this modern and almost artificial world that we forget that there are interesting things that are available uh, that we could use uh, around us. Um, in our teaching class, um, we were working with uh, craft students and uh, we try to introduce natural materials. Uh, these students have never touched bamboo before, although they live, you know, we live in Malaysia. Um, in this project, we've um, designed a simple frames, a simple frame structure, um, which we asked the student to complete using natural materials like bamboo and rattan. And these are weaving students, so we asked them to use materials that are available in their studio. So we're thrilled that the pieces that they come up with are, are rather, to me, quite amazing because they suggest a sort of a technique of weaving bamboo onto a, a structure which uh, suggests that it could be applied in a larger application, maybe a cladding or something. 
So we're fortunate to have um, opportunities to work on a number of pavilions over the years, and they allow us to really explore uh, forms, techniques, and local materiality, uh, something that larger buildings rarely presented itself. And one of these pavilion is a, a timber pavilion for a local art gallery in uh, Kuala Lumpur. And um, our early conversations with the art gallery owner, her name is Shalini, um, was that uh, the pavilion will be quite local uh, in terms of materiality. So we use local wood. And, and we wanted the pavilion to say something about building in Malaysia. So shading being very important, so we suggested the use of these galvanized metal panels. And it should be also quite interesting and kinetic. And these metal panels would be uh, connected to these planter boxes via a uh, rope pulley system, so moving the planters up and down, moves or opens and shuts the galvanized metal panel, which creates interesting shadow patterns on the ground, hence the name of the pavilion, uh, Shadow Garden Pavilion. So we worked with um, architecture students on this project. Uh, they are from the local university called Taylor's University. So they spent about three weeks of their school holidays working with us on this project. And since um, students are involved in this project, we thought it might be interesting for them to um, explore a technique called tangam. And this is a technique of uh, putting together timber structures without the use of nails, screws, or fasteners. Um, and uh, it is a method of jointing timber that can be seen in many cultures all over the world with slight uh, differentiation between them. So um, we did a lot of detailed drawings, so each unique joints have to be detailed and dimensioned properly. Um, so that students are able to um, produce the details. Um, they've, most of them have never really worked with timber, so they underwent a two-day uh, woodworking course at this workshop at their university and then spent about a week and a half um, in the workshop um, doing making notches and mortise and tenons, and then um, another week at site, putting it up together. So the pavilion is located in the courtyard of the art gallery, and it creates these interesting shadow patterns uh, together with the frangipani plants that are, that are placed in the courtyard. As an art installation, it says uh, something about building in Malaysia. I think um, it says uh, about the availability of local material and about shading and, um, and also about um, plants and about uh, where things grow very well in our country. They thrive. And in this uh, pavilion, we uh, planted um, plants that are associated with cooking, so they're very aromatic. As you enter and experience the pavilion, you're hit by smells that reminds you of a dish that you've had or your mother's cooking. In later that year that we finished the Shadow Garden, we were asked to design another timber pavilion for a location that's completely different. And we were approached by Malaysian Timber Council, um, who requested us to design a timber pavilion to promote Malaysian wood. In this instance, it's Maranti wood. And it was to be placed in an expo, uh, a product expo like this one, uh, which runs parallel with the AIA conference in Orlando in 2017. And so this space is um, a very, it's usually a very large hall with very little natural lighting. There's not much to respond to or to relate to. 
Um, it's only the neighboring, your neighbor's booths that you could actually relate to if you want to. So, um, what we try to do is to create an enclosed pavilion that kind of excludes the um, external environment as much as possible. So it's a simple uh, square enclosure uh, with this lattice-like um, timber walls on all four sides. So when we were designing this pavilion, we started looking at traditional uh, Malaysian uh, wood carving. And these wood carving are used in houses and in palaces as a way of um, allowing some light and natural ventilation inside the house. And they're quite rich and intricate and uh, quite complicated in design. And it's something that we would want to try to emulate, um, but in a more contemporary and modern way. So the result is this lattice-like surface, uh, which encloses the space, but it's still see-through at some, uh, depending on where you stand, but you are cut off from the environment if you stand at an angle from it. And so it consists of these repeating motifs of uh, rectangular forms and protruding, protruding uh, timber sections in this three-dimensional uh, three geometric arrangement. The timber pavilion is built uh, or fabricated in a workshop outside Kuala Lumpur. So here is uh, an image of the pavilion being assembled before it's de disassembled and then placed in the crate and moved to Orlando. So once it reaches the Orlando AIA conference um, location, uh, I think we had two days to put together the pavilion. So it was important that the pavilion is modular, uh, that it could be put together by uh, two people at least um, in an easy way and quickly. Therefore, we've designed it to be modular and each, modular, each module is about uh, two feet by two feet wide by two feet high and about half a foot deep uh, so that it can be picked up and fixed in position by, by one person without any heavy machinery. There are no columns and beams in this pavilion so we've designed special clips. Uh, here you see an image of the butterfly clip that holds the corners together and then there's this angled um, timber sections that holds the, the modules in this uh, vertical arrangement. And here is an image of the modules being packed into the crate as it's to be shipped to Orlando. In the AIA conference in Orlando, it was um, used in the way that we designed. They decided to use it again for the AIA conference in New York and because it's a modular, um, structure, it could be arranged in different ways. So in New York, you see that it's being arranged in a more open manner. Although we, we work with timber, we do prefer bamboo, mainly because we, we are a little bit careful with timber. It's such a precious commodity. It takes so long to grow and um, Bamboo, on the other hand, uh, grows very, very quickly, it grows to full mass in six months and can be harvested within three to five years. Um, and if you compare that to wood, soft wood takes about 30 years to grow. Soft wood is suitable for furniture. For hard wood, which is suitable for structure, it takes up to 50, sometimes 100 years to grow. And there is um, research that says that bamboo actually expels more oxygen and locks in more carbon. So in a way, it makes sense to kind of use more bamboo. So bamboo is a beautifully engineered building material. Uh, the fibers are said to be stronger than structural steel, and they are concentrated around the perimeter. And it's also hollow, which means that it's lightweight. You don't need heavy machinery when using bamboo in construction. 
and there are these nodes and diaphragms within the length of the pole that keeps it from buckling. Working with bamboo is different than working with any other building material. First of all, bamboo is not straight. Um, it's also conical in shape, meaning that the diameter is larger at the bottom and smaller at the top. And the cross-section of the bamboo is never a perfect circle. Um, and there are no two bamboos that are the same size. So, but um, it, it is a very easy material to work with if you know how to um, use them, especially in the pole form, which is the most sustainable way of using bamboo. Um, we first used bamboo when we entered a competition for uh, a project called the Millennium uh, Classroom Project, and uh, we won the first prize. Uh, it was for a wind-resilient classroom. The site is located in Philippines along the east coast of the Philippines, so the east coast uh, experienced a lot of uh, typhoons, or I think you call it cyclone here. So the, the building needs to be wind resilient and we thought bamboo being a very pliable material would be ideal for, for, for such a brief. And uh, we were the only entrants who actually proposed bamboo. So it's a, it's a prototype, so it's a, a simple small building. There are two classrooms, bathrooms in the middle and there's a veranda along the front and which, uh, which is slightly enlarged around the center. And we've made the classroom as po uh, porous as possible so that there's cross ventilation and um, also when there is strong wind that it will pass th through and uh, there will be less pressure on the walls. The classrooms are simple enclosures, but I think it's the veranda which is more popular with the children. It's a space for play, for informal uh, teaching. Like in Malaysia, uh, bamboo is not used in contemporary building construction. But like Malaysia, we have a, a history of using bamboo for our vernacular architecture. And this is the Bahai Kubo, which is a bamboo house in the Philippines, which is not much different from our village house in Malaysia, which is raised on stilts. And it uses bamboo almost uh, 90, for 90% 90 of, of its construction. It uses bamboo for structure and also bamboo panels for the walls. And this project is a prototype. It was built in 2011. It is uh, to test and see whether it's suitable to be used in the east coast of the Philippines. Um, so it still stands today. So as a prototype, you know, we could say, and it, it has survived a number of localized um, typhoons. So as a prototype, we could say that it's a success. And bamboo is great for structure that has to go through repetitive um, heavy loads like strong winds or earthquakes, mainly because it is pliable. And this is a photo of street hawkers. Uh, I believe it's in Vietnam and they're carrying their goods with this bamboo pole that is balanced on their shoulders. And what happens is they walk with this fast springing step so that the bamboo flexes up and down on their shoulders. And the, the weight that's on their shoulders is only half the time, so which makes their task a lot easier. And the same principle is applied to this bamboo classroom, that it could take uh, repetitive high loads, uh, particularly during strong winds. And the way bamboo fails is also very different from that of other materials. When it breaks, um, the fibers, most of the time, the fibers are still intact, so it keeps the building together for much longer compared to timber. When it breaks, it breaks clean into two. And uh, we've used a technique of uh, jointing bamboo using uh, bolts and also lashings uh, of strings. 
uh, which allows some movement to absorb the kind of high repetitive loads. And also we've made the structure repetitive throughout the plan so that in case there is damage, there will be damage, um, that it would be easy for the locals to kind of repair without having too many unique joints to deal with. And this is the first time we've done bamboo. Uh, we've worked with bamboo. And one of the important things that we found out in our research is that bamboo should not touch the ground. Because once it touches the ground, it would absorb moisture by capillary action. And once it starts to absorb moisture, it will start to rot very quickly and deteriorate and fail as a structure. So we've designed a kind of a detail where uh, there is a metal bar that sticks out from the concrete slab. And onto this metal bar is lowered the uh, bamboo column. And then it's bolted. And we've injected concrete into this part where the metal bar is. So it creates a strong anchor uh, to the slab. We've also um, did quite detailed drawings because we were in Malaysia, the buildings was in Philippines, and uh, we, there wasn't much uh, funding available for us to travel uh, during construction, so we did the drawings and passed it on to the clerk of work at site, and it was clearly drawn so that they could just follow what we have designed. The next pavilion is um, another bamboo pavilion, which is uh, done earlier this year. Um, we worked in collaboration with uh, representatives from UN Habitat to design a bamboo pavilion to be used uh, during the World Urban Forum, which ran for a week in Kuala Lumpur in February this year. And um, like most of our pavilions, we, we, we decided on a simple uh, square form and uh, it has four walls that are filled with these bamboo rings. The location of the pavilion during the urban forum to me is very, very interesting. Um, it is at this oldest part of Kuala Lumpur at the confluence of two main rivers uh, that runs through the city centre. And this is where Kuala Lumpur originates from. The name Kuala Lumpur means muddy estuary or muddy confluence. And it was at this, oops, it was at this, oops, sorry. It was at this muddy confluence that the name Kuala Lumpur originates. And you could see here the confluence of two rivers with a mosque at the junction. So it's interesting to see uh, a building with a very, very old building material, or a structure with a very old building material against the modern tall buildings in that area, and also um, the colonial buildings uh, in that area. We are a British colony up to 1957, just for your info. And the pavilion consists of approximately 7,000 bamboo rings. Um, and they were cut from leftover bamboo poles from another project. So it's recyclable material that we are using here. And the representatives from the UN Habitat suggested the use of these colored panels, which alludes to the UN's uh, sustainable design goal colors which we find really uplifts and really makes the pavilion much more interesting. And this is the view of the interior of the pavilion. The pavilion is used to host a number of activities um, run by the UN Habitat during the week-long forum. And the colored panels are actually translucent, so at night it does emit some light through, creating this stained glass effect inside. And it's quite popular with the Instagrammers during the week-long <laughs> forum. And um, the pavilion now has been moved. It's uh, to a new location. It was donated to a local university, so it's permanently at the architecture department uh, in a local university if anyone wants to visit. 
So the largest pavilion we did was the um, Bamboo Playhouse. And here we were approached by Kuala Lumpur City Hall to design a bamboo pavilion to be located at the Botanical Garden, which is the oldest park in the city. And bamboo plants thrives in Malaysia. We have about 50 species out of that. Uh, 25 species are um, indigenous. And we have species that have thick walls uh, that is suitable for construction. We don't have species that are as strong as the Guadua uh, South American species, but they are suitable for structural use. And the aim of this project is to dem demonstrate that bamboo is, is something that you know, is viable, something that could be used to build a, a structure. The pavilion is located at this oldest park. It's called the Perdana Botanical Garden, and this is an old picture of the uh, park. It has a lake in the middle, and you could see it was built by the British, so you see the British governor's house just up there looking down to the lake and the park. And today, the park is an important green lung for the city center of Kuala Lumpur. Um, it's surrounded by tall buildings. It has an area of about 91 hectares, and there's a lake with uh, several islands running uh, in, in the center of it. And when we were designing the playhouse, um, we again looked at existing typologies and uh, past typologies. And of course, we look at the typical uh, pavilion structure uh, with the raised floor and this sheltering roof. So what we decided was to have a series uh, of uh, wakafs. Wakafs are these um, uh, pavilions, as it's called in Malaysia and a series of uh, pavilions under a large roof, and they will be placed at uh, different levels to create a playful effect. So what you get are these uh, square platforms set at different levels, and as each one is a single pavilion, uh, so each one has a tree-like structure growing up from the center, and uh, there is opportunity, as you see, to create courtyards as well uh, between them. So the pavilion is located on one of the islands in the lake at the botanical gardens. Um, it's placed um, at the southern tip of the island. So you would enter the island from one bridge. And the way that is located is that you are kind of forced to walk along and enter and come out again and, and exit on one of the bridges. Uh, that's the reason why it's placed in such a way. So it sits at the edge of the island with some of the um, uh, platforms cantilevering over the water. And there are 31 platforms. And from the center of each platform, is this tightly wound bunch of five bamboo columns that opens up at the top uh, to become the roof structure. Um, from the front of the playhouse, the, 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 the platforms look like they are randomly placed at kind of arbitrary levels. But actually, there's a diagonal grid line going across them. And if you cut a section through the diagonal, you could see that it's actually uh, arranged in a very logical manner to, as it goes lower towards the water. The platforms are concrete. Uh, it's a decision made because we want to keep the bamboo dry as much as possible, the same way that we did for the Philippine school. So the bamboo uh, elements all start at platform level. And for the columns itself, we had to be extra careful. We've created a concrete stump, uh, which is splayed at the top. So any water that kind of uh, collects at the stump would be drained away very quickly. So within the botanical garden, I think we've created an interesting space, which is open to many different activities. and. Um, these are images that we showed our client 
before uh, we built the pavilion, and we told them, right, it's a, sp a space for play, uh, for events, for rest, and perf for performances. And upon completion, we were very, very pleased to see so many different activities actually taking place um, at the uh, pavilion. For example, there's a, a dance happening there, and then there's lots of children activities. This is a coloring contest that happened uh, just after the opening of the pavilion. And out of the 31 bamboo columns, uh, five of them has these bamboo baskets, and they're like tree houses. They create another kind of level of playfulness. Uh, so together with the whole um, different levels, it, it becomes a very playful structure. And on the island itself, there are many species of different bamboo trees. Uh, so it creates, I feel, a, an interesting backdrop to the pavilion. There are 31 platforms and 31 columns, and also 31 photovoltaic panels right above each column. And they provide, or they generate electricity for lighting the playhouse in the evening, and also for the, for the light fittings uh, for the whole island. And this is an image that's interesting. I thought you could see the tall buildings just behind the park with the cranes at the top, which is under construction. <coughs> um, another building material that we love to use is rubber wood. A rubber wood come from rubber trees, <coughs> and it's grown a lot in Malaysia. It's, it's not native to Malaysia, it actually comes from Brazil. Um, but it was brought in and, and it becomes a, 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 a kind of a huge um, thing. I mean, we grow a lot of rubber trees for latex and we export the material quite a lot. So after the rubber tree stops producing latex after 30 years, they are chopped down and they are turned into furniture. And it's a type of, rubber trees are soft wood, so they're not suitable for structural use, so they are for indoor use. So in an interior project that uh, we worked on last year, we extended the use of rubber wood beyond furniture. Here we use it for partitions and ceilings. This is the lobby to an office where we use rubber wood. And because rubber wood is soft wood, the color is very different from the other timber pavilions, which is hard wood. Uh, the denser the wood, the darker the color. So this is soft wood. It has a maple-like color, which gives a lot of warmth to, to an interior. And we've used um, rubber wood uh, for partitions. We've used it in combination with polycarbonate and steel. And this is another project which is a construction laboratory or an engineering laboratory. And here we use rubber wood as well for the framing of the walls. And this um, proposal consists of just a corridor with laboratories on both sides. And here you see the rubber wood structure being used for the framing of the walls. The contractor tells us that this is no good for walls because it's soft. But if you brace them well, I think they are very rigid uh, framing for walls. And here we've created, uh, this is our drawing, we've created ribbon-like windows, uh, which is continuous along the corridor, so that uh, you could see the lab um, w uh, from this corridor on both sides. It's also to kind of uh, spread natural daylight. You only get natural daylight from one side of the lab, so they kind of um, help to spread the natural daylight. And the laboratory receives many visitors, so it was important that they could see when they visit uh, the tests that are being conducted in the laboratories. And we used um, strong colors for the floor, which seemed to work well with the rub color of the rubber wood framing. For the corridors, we use uh, yellow epoxy flooring, and for the lab, blue. 
And this is my, I just put this up because it's my favorite image of the project. It's, you could just see one of the laboratory equipments peeking through the ribbon windows. And uh, also interesting view is that from one lab, you could see across the corridor to the, the other laboratory room across the space. Um, before Southeast Asia become developed, I mean, we're a hot and humid country. Keeping cool is achieved by shading the spaces and having cross ventilation across rooms. But as we get richer, more developed, more populated, uh, the demand for spaces that are cooled using mechanical ventilation increased uh, manifolds. And especially now with increasing re recorded global temperatures, the demand for mechanical ventilation is, is growing even larger. And uh, where I come from, air conditioning is turned on almost 24 hours. We work, eat, and sleep in air-conditioned internal spaces. So when we received a commission to design a school with a limited budget, uh, this is a government school, we were happy to find out that there is no budget for mechanical ventilation for the classrooms. Uh, there's only some money for air conditioned units for the teacher's room. So keeping classrooms co cool is very, very important in this project. So we did two major things in this proposal. One is to orientate the building the right way, and the other is to shade the, the walls. When we were designing it, of course, we like to look at what's been done in the past. And our school design for the past 10 years hasn't changed since the 1950s, 1940s. It is a single banked classroom with corridor on one side and windows on the other. Um, for us, this typology actually works very, very well in terms of passive solar design. There are openings on both sides, meaning that you can cross-ventilate and um, you get good daylight levels in the classroom without much glare. So what we've done is to arrange the classrooms in these parallel blocks so that they're all facing the right way, uh, not the right way, the same way. They're all facing the same way. And this is important because we want the classrooms to face north and south as much as possible. So the classrooms are uh, along the axis of east and west, so that the long facades are all facing either north and south. Uh, the site is, is quite small, and uh, this is the playing fields, which, which is shared with another school, and that's the only site we have for the classroom. So we managed to get it almost north. It's rotated about five degrees to the east, but it's quite a shaded orientation. North and south orientation is the sh most shaded orientation in, in, in the tropics. So on the north facades, you get corridors, and corridors automatically shade the classrooms. And on the south facades, you get windows, and we've added fins and overhangs uh, to shade. And here, the image shows it's doing exactly what they are meant to do which is to shade the, the window openings. And the interesting thing about designing in these parallel blocks is that it creates uh, multiple courtyards within the school, uh, which could cater for different activities as well. The classroom itself is bright uh, with very tall ceilings. We've, uh, we've removed the ceiling. Uh, what you see is the exposed uh, precast floor of the uh, level above, and we've just painted that, and ceiling fans are used to kind of aid uh, air circulation in the classrooms. Um, another building typology that we find that we keep returning to is the courtyard house typology. And we've done a number of houses over the years. This is five houses that we've done, which uses the courtyard form. And the courtyard form is great not only because it provides privacy, but it also allows for ventilation. The rooms are quite 
narrow, not narrow, they are single uh, banked rooms, so they allow for cross ventilation. Um, courtyards are a typology that uh, makes sense to us. In China, you see here, the courtyard form is uh, used to protect from strong winds, from floods, and also from wild animals. And in Islamic cultures, it's a private space akin to gardens of paradise in a dry, hot climate. Water is introduced in the courtyard to cool spaces by, by evaporative cooling. And, and in Malaysia, courtyard forms are found in this typology called uh, the shop houses. Uh, they're called the shop houses because they are uh, shops on the ground floor and then a house at the top. And they have this very narrow frontage, uh, about uh, five or six meters wide, and but they extend very long towards the back, sometimes up to 100 meters. And courtyards are introduced within the length of the house to bring in light and air into the house. So we've uh, used a courtyard uh, as a technique to bring light and air in this uh, simple and small extension project for a house in Kuala Lumpur. And this is the plan. This is the existing house. There used to be lots of haphazard extensions toward the, towards the back, which makes the house very, very dark in the center. So what we've done here is to add a, a, a large space, which is the kitchen and dining. We've pulled it back so that there is a courtyard space formed along the boundary wall. So here's the view of the courtyard. And, and it does tend to get quite gloomy uh, or dark during gloomy days because of the size of the courtyard is rather small. So we painted uh, the walls white and we've used white gravel on the ground as well. And what it does, it really does bring in light and air to the center of the house. Here is the relationship of the study of the house with the courtyard and we've created uh, a large an opening as much as possible, um, which can be opened fully. And because our weather is so wonderful, we rarely go below 28 degrees, so it can be kept open all year round. And this courtyard space almost becomes part of the internal space of the house. And in the kitchen and dining area, we've used uh, mesh. Uh, for the walls and for the folding doors. Again, this is to just keep the air moving in this space and light as well. And the folding doors open fully uh, along the wall, so they have this direct, uh, so the space has this direct relationship to the garden behind it. Uh, we propose a gabion wall along the boundary, and then there's a slope towards the back, uh, which has many fruit bearing trees, so it's quite a pleasant environment to have the doors all open all the time. And we've created a bench, a low bench along the, um, the, the, the wall or, the, or the, the boundary of the kitchen and dining. And what this does is, although it creates a strong boundary, but it, it in, invites people to sit and to enjoy the space uh, and also lots of interaction between the internal and external space. Another house that uses a courtyard typology is the Vermani house. And here um, is also a remodeling of an existing house with an extension towards the back. And it features a circular courtyard that separates the, the existing house with a new. And this is the existing part of the house, which is two stories. And we've added a pavilion-like structure, two stories towards the back. So the rear of the house, the extension, is the private zones of the occupants. Uh, this is where their bedroom, the baby's nursery is, their hobby room is towards the back. Whereas in the existing part of the house, uh, that's where um, all the living, dining, the public zones of the house, and the guest bedroom as well is located in the existing part of the house. So along the front, the house turns its back to the street. Um, privacy is important in this project, so 
all you see along the front is this kind of slit high level windows that turns the corner and a little hole for um, ventilating the bathroom behind it. And behind this wall is the master bedroom. Now, although we are excluding the external, um, it's interesting to see, for me at least, uh, to see the sun comes in and tracks itself around the room for about an hour every morning. If the house in front, uh, across, in front of the street is very closed up, uh, at the back is completely open. And uh, as this courtyard bridges the private zones and the more public zones of the house, so there's a lot of traffic uh, in this space, uh, which makes it very much the heart of the house. Um, we've also put the staircase in this courtyard, uh, which is unusual in Malaysia, and I'm sure in a lot of other places as well. Uh, the staircase is usually in the private domain of the house. And here, you know, every time you need to go upstairs, you would have to come up to the, come out to the courtyard. And uh, it makes the courtyard more like a habitable room rather than merely just a, a terrace. And uh, we wanted to see traces of construction in this house, so uh, it has a rawness which the client also love. Um, so we've exposed not only the, the concrete, uh, uh, we've also exposed all the wiring and all the piping in the house. We expanded the raw materiality seen in the Vermani house um, in another a new built house, it's a detached house called Sepang House. And here we've used exposed concrete which is softened by um, timber columns that holds up the roof. And here's a view of the house from a distance and one of the immediate things that you would notice about this house is its roof. It has a sheltering quality which is uh, a vernacular trait. It's, uh, a modern structures usually have flat roofs. Flat roofs don't really work in, uh, in a, a climate like Malaysia where we get a lot of rain. There's this terrible risk of, um, of uh, problem with water seeping into the house. And, and the roof is, sorry, the roof is designed to expel rainwater away from the house as much as possible. And here's the plan of the house. So again, like the school project, orientation is very, very important where uh, we have all the principal rooms, the living, dining, kitchen facing north uh, towards the garden and the pool is also faced north. And the other uh, spaces like the kitchen and breakfast area facing south. Uh, and there's in the middle of the house are where the artery of communication are located. This is where the staircase, staircases are organized and also the corridors. So the north facade is, the, is where all the principal rooms are located and on this facade are uh, where you would find all the large window openings which needs to be shaded. So we've used these columns, uh, timber columns which are placed quite close together in order to pull the roof out as much as possible, which not only um, shades the openings, but also shades the balconies and the terraces by the pool. On the west facade, which is facing the street, um, it gets uh, very hot in the afternoon, it gets the afternoon sun. So here openings are small and they are recessed back from the wall as much as possible. And there's a um, first floor balcony. And again, we've pulled out the roof and we've, we thought it's quite interesting to have a V-shape uh, column structure that supports the roof. Internally, we've introduced another material, which is uh, exposed brickwork. And this exposed brickwork uh, form the spine of the house and it organizes the staircases and also the corridors. So upon entering the house, uh, if you see concrete and timber outside, inside you're hit by lots of brickwork. Um, and if you look up 
at this foyer space, uh, you would see an opening in the floor, which, and then you could see the steel staircase that takes you from the first floor to the attic. And as you move further on, um, you see the spine brick walls organizing the concrete staircase. And you have the main spaces uh, on the ground floor on either side of this brick wall. And the concrete staircase, as it turns the corner at the landing level, it punctures out oh, and hovers over the living room before it turns back again to go up. And here's uh, the living room. We use a lot of louvers. Louvers has always been used uh, in tropical architecture in Malaysia, and it's something that works very, very well. You just need to open them. They provide security, but also allow for cross-ventilation. And we've used them also at clear story level. There are lots of voids in the floor, so as you come up, you can look down to the breakfast area and um, you are now moving between the spine walls along the corridor, moving towards the bedrooms. And the staircase, the second staircase, uh, we've made it deliberately lightweight using folded steel. Um, and the reason we use this is to suggest that we, we don't really use it very often because it's only the attic space. You only go up to, to, to kind of keep stuff or to bring stuff down. So the next uh, slides, next series of slides looks at how simple forms and geometries uh, can form kind of a successful background for everyday life. And earlier of my talk, um, I spoke about how in vernacular architecture there are uh, many indeterminate spaces that doesn't really prescribe use, and I find that interesting. In, in kind of in, in contemporary architecture. Um, this is an image of one of the peripheral buildings uh, found in the grounds of Taj Mahal in India. And it has a corridor on one side, I think mainly used for you know moving under a shaded area, but here you see it being used for prayers. And we find spaces like that very interesting, spaces that n are not overly designed uh, spaces that allow for different occupancy patterns um, and it opens up possibilities. Uh, when it does that, it, op it becomes a powerful tool uh, to contribute and to learn about the world. We recently completed a project called the Bazaar, which is a community building for a new housing development uh, just outside Kuala Lumpur. And this pro project uses simple geometry, uh, simple forms as a backdrop for different activities. And it has a um, continuous folding roof structure, which is uh, self-supporting. It has its own columns that holds it up and it shelters Below it, a uh, series of open and closed spaces. Uh, you, there are spaces that would, that now is occupied by um, cafes. There's a pet grooming store. Um, there's also uh, a myriad of different spaces for different things to happen. And this is the bird's eye view. You can see the folding roof structure. It is facing north along its whole length, so it's got great orientation. It's facing a field, so any um, activities can spill out to the field, and then there's a lake with an interesting replica of a Chinese ship in the lake. So the roof, I mean, the roof is, is the main thing about this thing, uh, this project is that it creates uh, shaded spaces. Um, for example, here you have a, a large uh, column-free space and there are lots of different activities like performances occurring there. And this photo is taken in the late afternoon. You see the shadows are quite long, which means the sun is over there. But during most of the day, it is very shaded. And the terrace along the front is about five and a half meters wide. So there are lots of things that could occur under this terrace space. Um, 
during activities. So there is no uh, single entrance to this building. You could enter the building from many, many directions and also exit uh, through many, many directions, making it truly, truly uh, uh, open-ended and, and, and very flexible. Uh, one prescriptive thing that we did probably is uh, introducing um, uh, swings to the structure, which proved very, very popular with the children. So there are myriad of different spaces within the pavilion, and it's interesting to see how they are used. Here you see uh, performers waiting uh, to perform, and a ping pong table is set up in the courtyard. We again use geometry for this uh, bridge project um, in Kuala Lumpur. Um, this is a bridge that's about 100 meters long and it spans a very busy dual carriageway road. It's a steel structure um, with fabric roof on top and that's the bridge which is a zigzag in form and this area of Kuala Lumpur is a very vibrant part of the city where you have uh, malls and small businesses and there are also housing towers <coughs> all around. And this is the train station which takes you to different parts of Kuala Lumpur. So what happens is this road is now cutting off this vibrant area to the train station and what our bridge is really bridging this area to the train station. So we've used um, a dynamic triangulated pattern to kind of picked up, to pick up the vibrancy of the space. And this sculptural triangulated pattern is used in the structure, in the handrails, and also in the floor finish of the uh, bridge. The bridge is quite wide because during peak hours it's heavily used and um, you can see the um, kind of folding handrail pattern and we've used a combination of a metal mesh and glass which creates very, very interesting shadow patterns. Shadows are very important to us. And we've also picked up the vibrancy of the place in terms of lighting in the evening. So the place is busy at night in the evenings, uh, people leaving for work, people coming to shop and uh, to have their meals in the area. So we picked up the vibrancy by lighting up the triangulated structure. Um, given the opportunity, we would always like to use sustainable materials as much as possible, like bamboo. Um, but uh, that is not always possible. As you can see, some of our projects are steel and glass and concrete. Um, they are mainly due to clients' preference or the cost. And I think one of the main reasons that we couldn't use sustainable material like bamboo in most projects is because it is not seen as a standard building material. Um, it is either seen as a special material to be used in you know, expensive resorts or it is seen as a poor man's uh, material in that it, or living in a, in, a, in a bamboo house suggests a kind of a regression of a lifestyle. Um, so, which is why, I think one of the main reasons why that you know, it is seen as not a, a viable building material. So about a year ago, uh, my office started thinking about making bamboo more standard, more mainstream. Uh, we started looking at um, the uh, house, uh, mass housing, and uh, we, looked, we started with looking at the terrace house typology. Um, and this is the typical terrace house that are built and sold across the country, which is two stories, sometimes three, with a uh, kind of living room on the ground floor, kitchen dining, and then bedrooms upstairs. And we thought, why 
don't we uh, suggest a, an alternative to this terrace housing, which is built completely, almost completely out of bamboo, and and to show that you know it's you don't really live in a bamboo hut when you're using bamboo material that it could form a very contemporary and modern lifestyle. And here is an image uh, to see to show the possibility of bamboo in in a modern contemporary development. So we are suggesting the use of bamboo in the pole form. Bamboo in the pole form is most sustainable because um, that's the form that uh, has the lowest embodied energy to turn it into uh, building material compared to composite. So we're suggesting the use of poles for the structure and then composite for the walls and floors. Uh, bam terrace houses has these party walls which are usually built out of masonry and they are quite thick, they are about 250 mm and we've kept that party wall because they are important to keep flame spread between one house and another. But it is possible to make bamboo flame retardant uh, by, uh, by coating or by impregnation methods. So um, to achieve this level of bamboo usage, I think there's still, still a long way to go um, because there are no building codes and there are no building regulations that cover bamboo in Malaysia and I'm sure in many parts of the world because it is seen as a very exotic and very, a material that's very, very new. Um, so we need to standardize the production of bamboo um, uh, make sure that we're using the right species and we're looking at prefabricating bamboo, industrializing the kind of the, uh, the, the making of bamboo frames that are suitable for housing. And also skills, uh, the techniques that are used in my project is most likely not suitable for housing um, because it takes a long time. So we need to look at, well, my office is looking at kind of industrializing or modernizing uh, different techniques of jointing timber so that they could be put together very fast and they would be put together in the factory and prefabricated and brought to site and fixed uh, very quickly in place. So here, uh, the rest are just uh, interesting images about what it feels like to live uh, in this uh, bamboo development and I think it's not bad at all. Here's the back lane of the bamboo house. And internally, we didn't want uh, the internal spaces to be too bamboo-ish. Um, so we proposed um, kind of composite bamboo panels and floors, which are already available. Some interesting companies are investing into looking at how these uh, bamboo panels uh, can be produced at uh, low cost to be used uh, widespread in developments like this. So in this house you could paint and wallpaper as you would in a, a contemporary house. So with this proposal we hope to demonstrate that bamboo is definitely not a poor man's material or some exotic material but we hope that uh, it, it, it can be seen as a standard building material, although there is a, still a very long way to go. Uh, it's, it will be great in the fight of the global climate crisis. And that's it from me. Thank you. <laughs> so I we'll just I have a couple of questions, and then we can open it up to the audience. Um, you, you presented so much. I think it's incredibly rich. I mean, just the the process of working, your way of looking very carefully, closely um, at your context. Um, you kind of, in a way, you're sort of synthesizing knowledge about the recent past, maybe, and, and in some cases much longer, mm -hmm. through vernacular buildings or historical vernacular buildings, and then overlaying that with a concern for a kind of climate climatic effects and environment, and um, I find that to be very inspiring, uh, personally. Um, 
it's something I'm also similarly interested in in practice, but you know, and then to do it through a very careful way, in this case of bamboo, and I think showing very clearly to, to the students a way of working from a small scale, really understanding a material very well, and then building up over time through that. And I think you know, you've, you've started with pavilions and you've left us with a housing project. Um, I, I would be curious to know a little bit more maybe about what you've learned along the way, um, maybe a kind of difference between working at the pavilion scale versus the housing scale. And um, I think you sort of set up um, different modes of actually um, from the joint and mm -hmm. connecting um, to, to then questioning and, and, and I think explaining very well the there's no building code, uh, how, to, how, how you could prefab yeah. things. Yeah. Um, working on the pavilion, bamboo pavilions, is a lot easier. I mean, we design a, a form and we develop the details and we get it built. Um, but with the housing project, of course, it, it throws up a lot of m many, many questions about who, I mean, first of all, I mean, it's a self-initiated project, so we have no client for this. Mm -hmm. And we, we hope that someone would come to us and say, right, we would like to explore this idea in a real life project. But of course, before this idea can develop into something physical, uh, there is so much that we have to do because we have to make sure there is supply for bamboo. There's mm -hmm. probably not enough in the country. There is, there's probably one or two commercial farms, but they don't produce probably enough bamboo for mass development. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And also the treatment of bamboo, um, a sustainable way of treating bamboo uh, to make it last for a very long time. Um, like timber, timber needs to be treated so that it, it you know, it's, uh, su it's not susceptible to insect attacks and things like that. So that's another issue. And of course, uh, prefabrication, detailing and things like that. So what we've done here is just the 1% initial stage of looking at bamboo in mass housing development. So there's so much more still to do. And of course, we also are interested in looking at bamboo at higher density structures, mm -hmm. like houses, uh, multiple level houses and skyscrapers. I'm sure it's possible. It is now possible to build skyscrapers out of timber. And then I don't see why we can't do that with bamboo. Mm -hmm. That's great. How do you, how do you think about, um, I guess in, in the projects, a lot of what you showed tonight had to do with um, a response to the environment and being very open. Mm -hmm. um, part of that also has to do with maybe the program or use yeah. and, and the sort of influence from the vernacular projects, mm -hmm. which were a lot of um, maybe beginning with pavilions because they're so light and yeah. open and they touch the ground lightly. Mm -hmm. But that seemed to translate into other types, um, like the house or maybe Vermonti House in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, where it's, it's very open, yet when you look at the floor plan, it seems quite intimate. So somehow there's a very sophisticated way of playing between a kind of physical space and view, but then also a, a proximity between bodies maybe in the space. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about, about that. Um, we, we do houses, but we also tend to get commissions which are more social, we do mm -hmm. the, the community projects. And I suppose that lends itself to being quite open. It works mm -hmm. with an open structure, especially the Bazaar project. Um, and because there are so many programs that it has to accommodate over the years, because the housing development is just starting to grow and it will grow and grow. So the, 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 the program that is being hosted would change and it just makes sense to do a building that's not over-prescribed, that's not too functional and more open-ended. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, uh, to me, it's interesting, it's most satisfying to see how the spaces you designed are used in different ways than you imagined. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I, uh, we deliberately start out that way, mm -hmm. um, but we do try 
to make spaces that are um, that could invite kind of different use mm -hmm. in our work. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if, if the space is used in ways that are unexpected and, you know, you feel that you've achieved something mm -hmm. in a way, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I also feel like you're um, maybe reading too much into it, but um, to go back a little bit to your PhD work and mm -hmm. because in a way you also started with an image of New York City mm -hmm. saying you were on the, your way to the then Venturi House and um, when I look at some of the architecture particularly for the houses, thinking about the Smithson's house. I don't know, could you say something? You're uh, in the US, I mean, yeah. could you say something about uh, modern versus postmodern, yeah. or is that um, well, something in your mind at all? Well, this, I was looking at the Sugden house by the Smithsons and the mother's house by Robert Venturi, and on the surface, both houses are very ordinary looking, mm -hmm. um, but the research develops into uh, saying that both houses are actually very different in approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what's interesting to me more is the Smithson's house where it's about ordinariness, uh, it's about light, um, but yet it is very sophisticated in a way. And there's modesty mm -hmm. to the work that they do, which I feel is has some influence in our work. I think our work mm -hmm. is quite modest as well. Mm -hmm. um, much more than the mother's house because it is on the surface ordinary looking, but it's actually very complex and there are lots of mm -hmm. contrived things that are done within the house, uh, which is not flexible, which is not too open, mm -hmm. whereas in the Sukhden house, I suppose I see an openness in that house that could, uh, suggest you know so many different kinds of interpretations mm -hmm. so i don't know whether there is a direct influence between the phd research with my work because there's so many other influences sure, growing up uh, mm -hmm. um, and also travel and things like that so maybe we'll open it up for some questions you mentioned treating the bamboo to make it more long lasting and i was just wondering um i know that there are ways to treat it to prevent termites but yeah. Uh, I'm from Singapore and we still get termites even with treated wood. I'm just wondering yeah. what you do about that for your bamboo. Yeah, um, bamboo would be attacked by this insect called the wood borers and it just disintegrates the bamboo like a termite wood to wood. Um, so the treatment is now, uh, th the most common way to treat bamboo is to immerse the bamboo in a boron salt solution for about three days to a week. There is no regulation, there's no standard. So some people say three days, some people say one week. Um, our pavilion has uh, been at site for five, going into six years now. So it has to, it has withstand the attack of, you know, it was, it is in the botanical garden. So there are lots of insects there. Uh, so, I think we need to get the treatment right. And if the treatment is right, and the species is correct, and the age of the bamboo when you harvest it is correct, it should last a lifetime. Um, so, but more research needs to be done to make sure that this, this can happen. Because there's so many advice about how to treat bamboo, there's so many different methods as well. But, um, you know, if you ask experts in bamboo, and they would say if you treat it properly, it should last a lifetime. Uh, thank you so much for coming and speaking to thank us. You. And I was interested in the last housing project when you spoke about not wanting to make the interiors too bamboo-y, maybe, mm -hmm. um, and thinking maybe about as we're trying to think of more sustainability sustainable materials and more sustainable structures, but yeah. still maybe maintaining these more sleek, modern surfaces. Yeah. Is that is that what we want, or is there... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the first images you showed of these very vernacular housing yeah. Yeah. Were, were extremely appealing, but yeah. I, I can understand sort of yeah. this push and pull, so maybe you could speak a little more to that. The thing is, um, vernacular house feel 
of interior spaces. So it's appealing to those who don't live in Malaysia. <laughs> um, I mean, I love it. Um, I think people like you, if you travel to Malaysia, I think it's such a wonderful thing to be able to live in one of those vernacular houses. But Malaysians, Southeast Asians, I think they want to live in a modern mm -hmm. house, in, in, in a house that they see Western people mm -hmm. live in. They want glass and steel and you know white walls and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, which is why we propose that you know this is not poor man's material. You're not living in a bamboo hut. Mm -hmm. This is a modern contemporary space that we are offering. It's a matter of taste, and that's what we found out that most people want. Mm -hmm. But it might change, and I mean, these vernacular houses are appreciated more and more mm -hmm. each day. So, I'm really interested in um, the way that you treat sort of your stairs, um, corridors, and all those circulation places. It seems like you have an idea of how to turn that into a more, more prominent architectural feature, in a sense that it will change how people use the surrounding of those area. So um, j yeah, I'm just curious to, to hear more how, how, you, how you approach it and how do you think about it? Sorry, approach? The, the staircases, the, the circulation area, how in you- In the house? Yeah. In your house, yeah, especially yeah. the one that you're taking the stairs to the courtyard. Um, so the more people are using the courtyard mm. as well as uh, the project where you are calling your staircases the spine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Well, staircases are wonderful things. I think we <laughs> architects are obsessed with staircases. I think when you start uh, designing your first house, you know, you know, you want to make a staircase a special thing, and it's an, a very important element in the house. You know, it's where you move vertically in the house, and I think it should be celebrated. Uh, in the Vermani house, we've placed it in the courtyard, uh, and it's great. But sadly, uh, the original occupants of the house has moved to another country, and if you know someone else is living there, they couldn't live with a staircase outside the house, which is strange, which is a bit uh, dismay for me. So they've added the staircase back inside the house. <laughs> so they are living with two staircases. But it is such a wonderful thing. We have this uh, wonderful weather. I mean, if you're from New York, I mean, going to Malaysia is paradise, really. <laughs> um, so why can't we celebrate being outdoors, but also shaded? Uh, so that's what the house, the Vermani house is about. And also in the Sepang house, the, the, the brick spine walls, again, um, I think I'm quite geometrical in my approach, so I feel I need to kind of uh, have a reason for doing things and, you know, there's the spine walls are there, not just because I want to make them break, they actually serve a certain function within the house that they, they organize the kind of communication and the, uh, the artery of uh, movement within the house. If you can assess the cost and the, the life uh, assess the life of the bridge, the bridge to yeah. the train station. Yeah. Well, it's made from steel, so it lasts a lifetime, I would think. It's made from steel uh, and glass, and um, the floor is has got this uh, composite of metal and very thin concrete. And it's got a fabric roof, which is Teflon roof. And Teflon roof, as you know, it, you know, it, it, uh, it doesn't let dirt stick to it. When it rains, it wash, the dirt washes away. So it's a very, very, I think, strong material. I think it's a little bit over-engineered by our engineer uh, for the structure. I, I asked for a slimmer column. Uh, so because it's so over-engineered, I would think that it would last a very, very long time for that one. I'm curious about your housing project and its uh, bamboo ambitions, mm. um, which are, um, I think, 
achievable, but it will take your lifetime and possibly yeah, um, yeah. even more. Mm -hmm. um, but then I look at what you have done in terms of the use of your bamboo in some of like the house that's on the screen right now, mm -hmm. where it is clearly has a, a modernist kind of impulse uh, that plays into um, the ambitions of your countrymen in terms of perhaps these Western prototypes. But then the roof structure, the shading structure, the cantilevered tilted um, uh, 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 supports are all out of bamboo. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is a pathway where the ambition isn't so um, so complete, yeah. um, but you just address those things that can be done and that you've proven can be done, mm -hmm. structurally, shading-wise, roof, and so on, and you take that as kind of a, a, a doorway into perhaps a, yeah. a broader use yeah. of the material. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, the bamboo terrace house is a vision for the future. I will not see it built in my lifetime, definitely. But we are taking it a step at a time. We almost never propose to a client a 100% bamboo structure. We try mm -hmm. to add a little bit here and there as a kind of an introduction, and we try to push it as much as possible. Um, but you are right. I mean, that's the way to go, kind of taking one step at a time. Great. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.